Hello, it's Malcolm here. Welcome to this week's video. The Supermarine Spitfire PR Type D, known as the PR Mark IV from December the 12th, 1941 onwards, is the most significant version in the development of photo reconnaissance Spitfires. If you're on my channel, it's because you want the real detail, the nitty gritty. If you want to skip the historical info and get straight to the nuts and bolts of this remarkable aircraft, go straight to the chapter I call the nitty gritty. There, I use images from the 1940s maintenance manual and photographs from declassified wartime documents to show how it all works. The Spitfire PR Type D is the only version of the Spitfire individually discussed in Churchill's wartime cabinet papers. Its extreme range and information gathering potential was that important. The useful side effect of that range was that if the ultra secret of the broken Enigma codes revealed a distant but valuable target that the RAF wished to attack, a PR4 could be sent to discover the target and for the PR4 to show itself to the Germans when the code breakers already knew the target was present. Let's get on with the story of the Supermarine Spitfire PR Type D. In early 1940, work had commenced on the PR Type D. All the versions prior to the Type D were standard fighter models modified at Heston Aircraft Limited by removing armament and any unnecessary equipment and then fitting cameras, squeezing in additional fuel tanks as well. Having exploited all the easy options to increase fuel tankage, a proposal was put forward to construct a special wing with large capacity internal tanks, in modern terms a wet wing. That is to say the tanks are not within the wing, but the wing itself becomes the tank. In 1940 this idea was a new innovation. When R.J. Mitchell first designed the Spitfire, the engine was to be cooled by a surface cooling system using steam passing through the front section of the wing. The cold air rushing past would provide the cooling. This early proposal is one reason why the Spitfire's wing was designed with the main spar and leading edge skin forming a fully enclosed D section. As it turned out, the Spitfire was fitted with underwing radiators, and the space forward of the main spar was left unused. In early 1940, development work commenced. Because of the sophisticated and untried nature of the wing ceiling proposal, work on the Type D was carried out at Supermarine, rather than Heston, where previous PR types had been converted. However, the wet wing progressed slowly while the Battle of Britain raged, as it required 30% more man-hours to build than a normal fighter wing. The new wing was eventually fitted to two PR Spitfires, P9551 and P9552, with the first delivered to the Photographic Reconnaissance Unit on September 21, 1940. The new design incorporated so much fuel tankage that the result was a range of more than 1,700 miles. On October 29, 1940, Flying Officer S.J. Millen flew the first operational sortie in P9551. In five and a half hours, he flew a mission to the Baltic seaports of Germany. The aircraft reached as far as Stettin, which is now part of modern-day Poland. On January the 19th, 1941, Flight Lieutenant P. Corbishley flew P9551 on a mission to Genoa in northern Italy. However, a navigational error took him off course and he wisely made for Malta, the nearest friendly territory. This makes P9551 the first Spitfire on Malta. Incidentally, if you're interested in PR Spitfires in Malta and like classic old movies, check out Malta Story, which is here on YouTube. On screen now are several images that I have enhanced from the PR Spitfire maintenance manual. The lowermost image is the undersurface of a PR Mark 13 fighter reconnaissance aircraft wing. You'll notice there are two gun ports highlighted, and if you look carefully there are a total of five hand holes through which a worker could put their hand for riveting the wing. One of the five is towards the left-hand side and is quite dark, but 
it's got a little bit of uh, color on it. The uppermost image is the underside of the leading edge of a PR Type D. It has a total of eight of these hand holes and a skilled worker would work through those hand holes riveting the wing together. It was a time-consuming and skillful process. Now we're looking at what that worker would be riveting. You'll notice this is a section through the main spar along the length of the wing. You'll notice that the rear of the tank, here referred to as the sealing material, is wrapped around an aluminium L section that I've highlighted in yellow and that is compressed against the skin of the wing which I've highlighted as green and there are two rivets holding everything in place. Appearing on screen now which I've colored purple is a one-way valve known as a clack valve. These were fitted to ribs 5, 9, 13 and 17 inside the sectioned wing tank. The idea being that fuel could flow towards the center of the aircraft, towards the main feed connection, where the fuel was taken to the forward upper fuel tank when in flight. Once in flight, the fuel tanks were automatically pressurized to 5 psi above 20,000 feet by air from the pressure side of the fuel system's vacuum pump. Incidentally, the wing tanks are filled on the ground with the whole system slackened off pressure wise via the upper main tank with the fuel simply running in through the interconnecting pipes. In the Spitfire the actual engine was always fueled from the forward main tanks. This illustration shows the pilot's controls for moving fuel from the wing tanks into those forward main tanks. He would operate a green lever to take fuel from the starboard tank and a red lever to take fuel from the port tank and in flight he would alternate between the two tanks. From time to time the wing tanks would need to be drained for maintenance purposes. So on screen now we've got an enlargement of the maintenance manual drawing and you can see the drain port of the wing highlighted. On the right of the screen is an enlargement from a PR11 drawing which shows the location of this drainage port as well. I mean, it's a later mark of Spitfire, but the drain is still in the same location. Experience with the PR4s operating in the Middle East showed that after a period sitting in the sun, they could actually burst their wing tanks. This led to the introduction of an air expulsion valve on top of each wingtip. The external evidence of these valves were these thin pipes as seen on this wingtip of a PR4. Also on screen there is a piece of line art showing the location of the small pipe and also another piece of line art from the maintenance manual that shows an extra filler cap on the outboard wing and access to a float vent as well. Before we leave fuel tanks behind altogether, I'm going to cover the tankage carried by the first hand-built Type Ds and then the later series-built aircraft. The first handmade Type Ds had a wet wing incorporating 57 gallons in each wing plus the 29 gallon tank behind the cockpit first seen in the PR Type B. This was in addition to the 85 gallons in the two fuselage tanks forward of the cockpit. Because of the weight of fuel at takeoff, and especially due to the weight of fuel carried behind the cockpit, these first handmade Type Ds were barely flyable during their first 30 to 60 minutes in the air. They became stable once this rear tank was emptied. The sequence of fuel use was to burn the fuel in the rear tank first, then the drop tank if fitted, and then the two wing tanks, switching back and forth at 15 minute intervals. Then the lower fuselage fuel tank was burned, and finally the upper fuselage tank would be used. Series production Mark IV aircraft had their wing tanks increased from 57 to 66 and a half gallons each, and the rear fuselage tank was removed altogether. Total fuel capacity was now 85 gallons in the standard fuselage tanks and 133 gallons in the wings, which resulted in a range of 1,800 miles. Without fuel behind the cockpit, 
aircraft control and taxiing, and early into the flight, improved. Because of the huge volume of fuel carried, the Type Ds were nicknamed the Bowser model. When I interviewed Wing Commander Roy Buchanan, some of whose photos appear in this video, he referred to the Bowser model and how their missions became much easier with its range. Officially, the Type D was called the Extra Super Long Range model, with the earlier Type C being the Long Range and the Type F being the Extra Long Range. Thank goodness the range was now long enough, they were kind of running out of names. Now let's just briefly talk about oil tanks. Like the first handmade Type Ds, the series production aircraft featured an additional 18 gallon oil tank in the old port inboard gun bay, plus the standard Mark V fighter sized oil tank under the engine. Therefore, the Type Ds did not have the distinctive chin seen on the earlier PR Type C and F aircraft. The chin would later return on the PR 9, 10, and 11 models. Next up is the cameras. From here on, I'm going to refer to the aircraft solely as the PR4, rather than chop and change between Type D and PR4. Uh, and we're going to talk about the three different camera sets used in the aircraft. All three were carried in the rear fuselage and designated sets W, X and Y. We will talk about them in turn, but first take a quick look at the cameras themselves. The naming convention for the camera is that the F number is the focal length, and then the lens is described in inches. Here are the F24 variations, and the F52s will follow on. These images are from a declassified March 1945 publication named Evidence in Camera, which includes cameras used in the PR4 as well as later types such as the PR11 and 19. This third photo of cameras is from a pre-war document so we can get some idea of the progress made in a few short years. Now on to the camera sets. Here is a diagram of the W set from the PR Spitfire maintenance manual. It comprises two F8 cameras with 20 inch lenses and was intended for high altitude photography. And now a scale illustration of the W installation also from the maintenance manual. Here is a diagram of the X set. X set was two vertical F24 cameras with 14 inch lenses and one oblique F24 with an 8 or 14 inch lens. This set was for lower level photography below the cloud base or in poor weather conditions. Keeping the cameras warm was an issue that had to be dealt with. In this illustration of the X camera set we can see the inlet pipe for warm air being bought from the radiators and we can see the bags surrounding the cameras. We can also see a canvas sheet fitted at frame 15 behind the cameras. Here is a posed photo of a ground crew member fitting an F24 camera with a 14 inch lens into a PR4. It is possible this is an early PR11 by the way. However, the cramped fit of the camera is evident in the photo. Not much room to spare at all. And here we have a close-up photo of an X-set oblique mounted camera in a Russian operated PR4. It also shows an F24 with the 14 inch lens. The mounting system is a standard RAF type 25 camera bearing used to mount and align these F24 cameras. Just to add some extra detail about the X-set oblique cameras, here is the Russian PR4 zoomed out and we compare illustrations of the standard Type 25 camera bearing and a modified Type 25 required to mount an F24 camera with an 8 inch lens. The shorter lens tubing meant the body of the camera needed to move closer to the camera port and therefore a more cramped bearing. And now the Y set. It was one large vertical F52 camera with a 36 inch lens for high resolution photography at high altitude. Here is a partly colorized maintenance manual image of the Y installation and an illustration of its camera warming bag arrangement. 
And now a scale illustration of the warming system's pipes, followed by a photograph of an F-52 camera held in the Swedish Air Force Museum. W and Y set mission profiles were similar and used when little or no clouds were expected. The pilot flew at high altitude all the way. If clouds were expected, an aircraft with an X set would be sent, flying there and back at high altitude, but near the target, descending below the cloud base. A little off topic, but I've got this photo, so I'm going to show it. This is an F-52 camera mounted inside the fuselage of a mosquito. The spaciousness of the mosquito arrangement is self-evident. A lot more easy to get along with, I think. This is a Type 35 camera controller. Uh, it was used in the PR4, however all the photos I have of it in position show it in a PR Mark 11. Uh, it was positioned where the fighter types had their gun sights. Uh, I will do a video on the PRs 9, 10 and 11 at a future date. In the meantime, please do hit the like and subscribe buttons. It certainly helps me build this channel. Thank you.